The bogs and marshes of Newfoundland's Belle Island teem with legends, and a stretch of forest known as Dobbin's Garden and the adjacent Butler's Marsh are the home of the terrifying Belle Island hag and the even more vicious creatures known simply as fairies. As the story goes, in 1939, a young woman got lost in the woods of Dobbin's Garden. Those born and raised on the island feared that the legends were true and refused to enter the area after sunset. But she was a recent immigrant and was unaware of the stories. Some claim this innocent girl fell victim to the wrath of the fairies who take vengeance on anyone they find passing through their forest. The fairies are malevolent creatures of Irish folklore, which dwell in forests and bogs. They are territorial beings with a deep and inexplicable hatred of humans. Those who enter their realm are rarely heard from again. The girl cried for help, praying that the townspeople would come to her aid. But they were too petrified to set foot in the forest and no one came for her, except the angered fairies. The terrified young girl cursed those who refused to help her while she suffered her ordeal alone in the forest. Legend has it that after her death, she returned to haunt Dobbin's garden as the vengeful Belle Island hag, still seeking retribution from anyone who dares enter the forest. Newfoundlanders have embraced the legends of the Irish and made them a part of their culture. Nowhere is this truer than on Belle Island in Conception Bay. Tales of fairies and ghosts are a part of life, and the story that most embodies this is the legend of the Belle Island hag. My name is Henry Crane, and I'm standing uh, in front of Dobbins Garden here on Bell Island. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, legends that are associated with Dobbins Garden is concerning what's called the Bell Island Hag. Basically, the hag was some kind of shrouded white creature that would, that would, come, from the, would come from the swamp at the bottom of Dobbins Garden and overpower men. If a man were caught there alone, all by himself, in the evening at any given time, he would smell this, this awful stench. It was a fecus type rotting smell that, that would happen and, and the men would become paralyzed with it. And beneath the cloak uh, above her face, you would see a scabby, scary, peeling skin blank eyes, and as the face got closer, the men would pass out. A man who had been trapped in Dobbin's garden after dark was found the following day, staggering out of the woods, all the color drained from his face a woman tried to calm him, but all he could remember was the overpowering stench and the horrible nightmarish face of whatever he had seen. Now, where the legend came from, there's all kinds of stories. It was said that uh, there was this young girl who died in the woods and she was calling for help and she died in the swamp. Nobody came to her help. They were afraid of what was called fairies, or the little people. And they would not go into the woods to help her, because nobody came to her aid whenever, and whenever anybody was out in Dobbin's garden. She would give them what it was like to die in the swamp, the taste, the smell, the stench, the stink, and for not helping her when her cries of help were, went unheard. The hag is not the only terrifying creature on Bell Island. In the adjacent Butler's Marsh, dwell the most feared creatures of all, the evil fairies. Butler's Marsh has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, folklore associated when it comes to fairies. Now, 
Our fairies are our little people. Sometimes they're happy little people, but on Belle Island they were malevolent, evil little people. Children growing up near Butler's Marsh are taught about fairies at a young age. Before they cross the marsh, their mothers place pages from the Bible in their pockets to ward off these creatures. They also carry pieces of homemade bread to appease any fairies who might be encountered. Only after taking these precautions does a mother feel her child is safe entering the marsh. If one of the fairies comes too close, the crumbs of bread are offered up as a token of respect. There's quite a few instances of, of, of people having uh, uh, contact with, with our type of fairies. A local miner had been missing for three days when he finally emerged from Butler's Marsh. He was physically and emotionally shattered, left only with vague memories of what had happened to him. One night after working late, he decided to take a shortcut home through Butler's Marsh. Almost immediately, he heard strange sounds around him. He knew he was not alone. Although he had grown up listening to the tales of Butler's Marsh, he was a rational man and never believed in the legends. The man that came out of Butler's Marsh, uh, when he, he went in, he disappeared for three days in a stretch of ground that's only about 150 feet. He was, uh, he was very simple-minded, he was very crippled up, and he was working in the mines he could never work again. And he thought he had only disappeared for an hour, and he was gone for three days. Would I stay in Dobbins Garden by myself? I don't, no, no, I wouldn't. Right? I don't know if anybody else would, but I know I would. I believe in the legend. I believe the legend is true. The people of Bell Island take these local legends and folklore very seriously. And visitors will be wise to heed their warnings before venturing into the area's forests and marshes after dark. At Fort McLeod, Alberta's Empress Theater, an actress studied her script in the balcony. Believing she was alone in the building, she was surprised to hear footsteps coming from the first floor. Cautiously, she approached the stairs, wondering who else could be around. As she looked down, the footsteps abruptly stopped and there was nobody in sight. Suddenly, something pushed her. When she recovered, she looked up, but there was nobody there. Once again, the theater was quiet. Shaken but unharmed, she wondered if anyone was ever really alone at the Empress Theater. The world of the theater is one of great dedication, commitment, and sacrifice. 
Many, whether they are actors, technicians, or managers, find the Playhouse more of a real home than their own. It should not come as a surprise that some of them chose to linger on after death. The Empress Theatre in Fort McLeod, Alberta, is a perfect example of this undying love for the stage. The Empress Theatre was built in 1912 and opened in 1912. The Empress Theatre is the oldest theatre of its kind in Alberta. It was during the 1980s, uh, during the heyday of the Great West Summer Repertory Theatre, and around the time of the restoration of the, uh, the Empress Theatre in 1988-89, that uh, reports of a ghost began to surface. Most of the, the, the reports uh, concentrate around times where the theatre was in trouble, either financially or physically. Um, there was a, a time where the theater was in threat of being shut down, and there were, there were more reports at that time. During one financial crisis, the Empress almost closed its doors permanently. A staff member sadly packed some of her personal items. She thought she heard footsteps in the empty theater, but could not trace them. Then she smelled cigar smoke wafting up from the basement. She cautiously made her way down to the dressing room. It was empty. But the smell of cigar smoke still lingered. Of course, all these reports are accompanied with uh, uh, distinct smells of tobacco. So this uh, w um, developed into um, uh, the, the ghost being named Ed uh, because of this, uh, this character who worked here at the Empress Theater. During the Prohibition era, a technician named Ed worked at the theater. He loved the exciting atmosphere there and considered it his second home. He also loved music, cigars, and liquor and ran a profitable bootlegging operation on the side. But Ed had a falling out with some of the gangsters he supplied and was stabbed to death in the basement of the Empress. From that day on, Ed's second home seems to have become his eternal one. Reports of uh, uh, musicians and performers being on stage and seeing a man in the far back corner of the balcony sitting there night after night uh, and, of course, not being identified. A local pianist was performing her recital at the theater. As she made her way through a difficult piece, she was shocked to see a man standing on stage with her. He stared at her coldly. Being a professional, she continued playing, but was very shaken. When she finished the piece, the mysterious man was gone. She left the stage disappointed, feeling her performance had been ruined by the appearance of this mysterious figure. She explained what had occurred to the stage manager, wondering how he could have allowed this to happen. He went to investigate when he saw a shadowy figure standing in the balcony. The man vanished. He had enough and left whatever was in the balcony in peace. The most unusual encounter with Ed happened at the box office. Patrons began entering the theater before the house opened claiming a gentleman in the box office had sold them their tickets. An usher reported the strange incident to the manager and the two rushed upstairs to see what was going on. When they arrived at the box office, the man had disappeared, leaving behind nothing but the ticket stubs and the customer's change. Even more mysterious was that there were no men on the staff that night. Many speculate that Ed decided to lend a hand that evening. 
if we have a resident ghost, then I think that co that completes the picture. We're actually quite pleased that, that we have someone here who, uh, who enjoys the theater from the other side. Ed's love of the Empress Theater may have carried over beyond death, and perhaps during times of trouble, he returns to help ease the burden on the theater staff by reminding them that like him, this legendary place will never really die. For one terrifying week in 1903, few dared to venture out of their homes after dark in Wilno, Ontario. An unspeakable evil had begun to prey on the town, something that these Polish immigrants believed existed only in legends. No one was safe. the townspeople knew that the most terrifying of legends had come to their village. There was a vampire in their midst. Most consider vampires to be the stuff of legends, legends brought to Canada by early European settlers. At the beginning of the 20th century, folklore and fact collided in the Polish village of Wilno, Ontario where many claim a wave of vampire attacks shattered the small community. The legend of the Wilno vampire began with what should have been a joyous time. A newlywed couple was looking forward to a long life together. The young groom had immigrated from Poland and had used every cent he had to purchase a small piece of land for him and his wife. As farmers, he hoped their lives would be happy but humble. Unfortunately, the young bride was suffering from what is now known as clinical depression, a condition which tormented her, pushing her to the depths of suicidal despair. Soon, this sadness became the only emotion she could feel, and eventually she could stand no more. As a devout Christian, she knew suicide was a grievous sin, punishable by eternal damnation. But her living hell was far more difficult to endure. She walked out into the lake that bordered their farm and took her own life. her husband made the horrifying discovery. He could not bear the thought of burying her in unconsecrated ground, the fate of any suicide. So he claimed that she had drowned accidentally. Little did he know, his lie would have devastating consequences. Her body was laid out in the village cemetery chapel before burial, allowing family members to come from hundreds of miles away for the viewing. A few nights later, the dead woman's cousin felt compelled to visit her relative one last time. According to Polish folklore, a suicide victim laid to rest on hallowed ground 
will become a vampire who feeds on the blood of its own family. As the young cousin entered the chapel, she was shocked to find the casket empty. Suddenly, her cousin appeared standing before her. As the dead woman stared back at her relative, the young cousin became entranced by her gaze, terrified but unable to move or look away. The young girl was never seen again, but she was only the beginning. The vampire's youngest sister was her next victim. Prayers were written on paper and placed in the little girl's mouth in an attempt to keep her from becoming one of the undead. Knowing he was responsible for the family's suffering, the desperate young husband decided to make amends. His mission was a sad and painful one, but he knew what had to be done. He had studied the folklore of his native Poland and had discovered a way to put an end to this curse. He approached the chapel where his wife's body was laid out peacefully. She looked like she was merely asleep. The one sure method of killing a vampire was to slice off its head during daylight while it slept. The young man gathered his courage. For a moment, he hesitated. The head was placed at the vampire's feet finally freeing his wife from her curse. The young man confessed what he had done, and he was tried for desecrating the chapel and the body. A jury of townspeople found him not guilty, arguing that he had done what was necessary to rid the village of evil. The body of the alleged vampire was cremated, leaving only a legend behind. Today, Vampires are rarely spoken of in Wilno, except to deny their existence. But something unspeakable did happen in this quaint Ontario village. And the legend, like the vampires themselves, live on forever. There is an inn at Niagara-on-the-Lake that flies the British flag 24 hours a day, even though the owners are not English. At the Old Angel Inn, the Union Jack flies for a very different reason. A tourist visited Niagara-on-the-Lake during the American Independence Day weekend. She loved the old world charm of the town. It made her feel as if she had traveled back in time. After a day of sightseeing, she returned to the Old Angel Inn where she was staying for the night. Among the various souvenirs she had picked up was an American flag, which she draped over an end table before settling down for a quiet night's sleep. But it would not be as peaceful as she had hoped. She awoke with the sensation that something was in the room with her. In the mirror, she saw the reflection of an angry face staring back at her. She turned and was confronted by a man in a red military uniform. He stared at her disdainfully and vanished.
Shocked by the experience, she decided to speak to the managers. As she left the room, she noticed something on the hallway floor. Lying there was the American flag that had been in her room only moments before. She glanced up and again saw the uniformed man staring at her disapprovingly. Or was it the object in her hands that he so despised? Walking down a street in Ontario's Niagara-on-the-Lake, one could easily forget that it was once a battlefield burnt to the ground in the War of 1812. It has been called the most haunted city in Ontario. Among its many ghosts is Captain Swayze, a permanent resident of the Old Angel Inn. Many believe that the ghost that haunts the Old Angel Inn is that of Captain Swayze, a noble British soldier stationed at Niagara on the Lake during the War of 1812. But he was conflicted. On the one hand, he was in love with a local Canadian woman and was to meet her at the inn so he could guarantee her safe passage across enemy lines. On the other hand, duty called. He was carrying confidential documents vital to the war effort. Would he protect his love or deliver the documents. He chose the girl. When she failed to arrive at their rendezvous spot, it was already too late for him to reach the retreating British forces. With the information he carried, he knew he would not be safe. It is said that he then rushed into the basement of the Old Angel Inn to either conceal or destroy the documents rather than let them fall into enemy hands. But he had been followed. The American soldiers cornered him in the basement where he was savagely beaten to death. These agonizing final moments of Swayze's life may be what has trapped his spirit at the Old Angel Inn. Could it be that this brutal act by the invading U.S. soldiers has forever embittered him against all things American? There are certainly a few smaller incidents that do happen at the Angel from time to time. Um, lots of glasses falling off shelves, things moving around. Footsteps are very commonly heard in the building when there should be none. The ghost at the Old Angel Inn is not a belligerent or aggressive spirit unless he is provoked. One American tourist who heard the legend decided it would be funny to intentionally antagonize the spirit. He began to make anti-British comments, some directly relating to the War of 1812. The spirit did not find his antics amusing. The tourist was suddenly pushed from his stool as if some invisible hand had shoved him. Looking up from the floor, he saw a translucent figure in a red uniform staring down at him. This American tourist and his opinions were quickly bound for the border. Should also tell you about the British flag, which we fly over the angel here, over the front door and the side door as well. Um, we fly the British flag, the old Union Jack, um, to calm our ghost, so to speak. He uh, is, the legend says, he remains harmless as long as we fly the flag. So we never take it down, ever. The Old Angel Inn's Captain Swayze is one of Canada's most famous and enduring ghosts. His legendary dislike of Americans seems to have subsided somewhat. However, one might want to give careful consideration to their words in this phantom's realm here at the Old Angel Inn. Coming up, everyone is drawn to Ontario's supernatural Triple Thrill Hill. There is a small hill on King Road in rural Burlington, Ontario 
that is believed to have an unusual magnetic attraction. Unaware of the area's supernatural reputation, a father and son were surprised to experience this strange phenomenon firsthand. Driving down the road, they realized they had made a wrong turn. As a result, they were lost. The father pulled the car over, put it in neutral, and asked his son to hand him a map. While the father was studying the map, his son noticed their car was mysteriously being pulled forward, up the hill. Dad, we're moving. We're moving. The two lost travelers were confused, but astounded by what they had just witnessed. The father took control of the car and stopped at the top of the hill. They got out and inspected the vehicle. Neither father nor son could explain how or what had just happened. They returned to the vehicle, baffled by their experience. Slightly shaken, the two drove off, leaving behind the strange phenomenon known as Magnetic Hill. In Burlington, Ontario, there is a peculiar hill which seems to defy gravity. It mysteriously pulls cars up to its peak, and people flock there hoping to experience the unusual phenomenon. But it would seem that we are not alone in our fascination, and that magnetic attraction is not the only unexplained mystery on Magnetic Hill. We have taken three different cars out there, stop at the bottom of the hill, or what appears to be the bottom, put the car in neutral, shut it off, and it will roll up the hill to the tree. There is a legend that goes along with it. Many years ago, a school bus filled with children went out of control and crashed into the willow tree. And it is said, when the car stops at the bottom of the hill, the children from that school bus will push it up the hill to the willow tree where they died. Some say that if you sprinkle your bumper with baby powder, that when it goes to the top of the hill, if you get out and inspect your bumper, you will find child-sized handprints in the powder. Many strange occurrences take place on Magnetic Hill. Traffic records show this hill has been the site of many accidents. Perhaps that explains why ghostly apparitions make regular appearances on King Road. One story tells of a young man who was driving home late at night after completing his shift at work. He was tired, but just wanted to make it home. Sadly, his fatigue would be the cause of his demise. The young man lost control of his car and crashed, killing himself instantly. Some theories maintain that the hill's magnetic pull is generally harmless. However, others believe that its strength can fluctuate, causing vehicles to lose control. Some believe that this victim has returned after death to the site of his horrible accident and is now a restless soul, eternally roaming this road. A woman ran into car trouble on this very road, underestimating the amount of fuel needed to get to her destination. With jerry can in hand, she began a long journey to the next gas station. Seeing a young man in the distance, she hailed him, hoping he would help her. The man ignored her and walked away. Disappointed, she continued on alone in her search for gas. As she walked along, lost in her thoughts, the same man suddenly appeared in front of her she was startled. The young woman was frightened and confused. 
she ran in fear for her life. Although most eyewitnesses describe seeing the ghost of a young man, no one is sure exactly how many spirits haunt King Road. On top of cars being pulled uphill and ghosts haunting rural highways, King Road is also famous for one more mysterious occurrence. There have been claims that there have been UFOs spotted from that location. So far, we have only gotten orbs on film, but we are hopeful that we will capture more. An amateur video enthusiast came to the clearing just behind Magnetic Hill in order to experiment with night exposure. A light appeared and traveled across the sky. Then, in an instant, it was gone. The photographer was confused, not exactly sure what he had seen. He left the site, planning to give the images he had captured a closer look. Some speculate that UFOs are attracted to the area because of this magnetic quality, which acts as a navigational point for extraterrestrial travelers. Why Burlington and why this hill? Visitors and paranormal researchers continue trying to answer these questions. What they do know, however, is that this place in Ontario is the only location in the world known to contain such varied and potentially terrifying paranormal activities. This historic building in Northern Ontario has a great deal of history. However, history is not the only thing lingering within its walls. One day, as a staff member entered the house, an uneasy feeling came over her. As the employee walked from room to room, she grew more and more uncomfortable. The appearance of an apparition stopped her dead in her tracks. This unsuspecting employee had come face to face with the resident spirit of the Mathers Walls House. In Kenora, Ontario, a building was erected for the employees of the local sawmill. One can only begin to imagine the hardships these people faced in this wild and rural part of Canada. Today, Mathers Walls is vacant except for an occasional tour group and the odd spirit passing through its rooms. This is the Mather Walls house and uh, some people believe that it is in fact haunted. As early as the 16th century, settlers began making their homes in Northern Ontario. In the area now known as Kenora, prominent Ottawa businessman John Mathers set out to make his dream a reality. Mathers developed a 200-acre site for his sawmill. He also built a residential house for the mill's employees, now called the Mathers Walls House. Over its many years, this home has played silent witness to great joy and tremendous sorrow. The early 1900s were the most difficult years. Spanish influenza ran rampant through this small community. It is believed that during one of these epidemics, an employee's wife contracted the devastating flu. But so little could be done for those who were sick. The woman's husband held her hand, comforting her as best he could.
the cold, damp rag he used to cool her brow did little to ease her pain. And eventually, she succumbed to the disease. He had lost the love of his life. His sadness overwhelmed him, and he knew there was only one way to end his suffering. Naively believing he would be reunited with his wife in heaven, he took his own life. He uh, was so distraught that uh, he went to his family cabin and committed suicide. Now, at that time, the, the family locked up his room, and it wasn't open for like 50 years, and it uh, wasn't open until 75, and just it's like a time warp. Uh, when they opened the, the room, it was, hadn't changed in all that time. However, it seems instead of the hoped-for reunion, his spirit still remains bound to this house. While on a tour of the Mathers Walls house, a woman stopped to admire a picture on the wall. The guide left the tourist to explore and enjoy the house on her own. The tourist was distracted when, out of the corner of her eye, she noticed something moving. Turning, she saw a spirit sitting at the head of the table. For a moment, the visitor froze, then slowly backed away, attempting not to disturb this ghost. The woman ran out the front door to tell the tour guide what she had seen. The guide then told the visitor that she too had an experience with the resident ghost and that the spirit seemed friendly. She assured her there was nothing to worry about. Things tend to move every now and then, go missing. Uh, chairs have sort of moved themselves in the room without anyone being there. Like many old houses, maintenance is required. And in 1984, the Mathers Walls underwent an extensive interior restoration. During the restoration, a painter was hired to repaint one of the rooms. He began to set up, laying a worksheet out on the floor and preparing his tools. As he did so, he heard footsteps coming from the hallway. Initially, his search for the source of the footsteps was fruitless. And then, upon re-entering the room where he had been working, he was confronted by the resident spirit. The painter left, vowing he would never return to the house again. Ontario's Mathers Walls has had hundreds of inhabitants, and the lives of many who lived there were filled with hardship, and sorrow. While it comes as no surprise that a spirit seems eternally bound to this place, it makes it no less terrifying for the visitor when confronted by this ghost. In the 1820s, the military garrisons near St. John's, Newfoundland were a remote and lonely posting, thousands of miles from the soldiers' British homeland. Though the empire was at peace, day-to-day -day life on this isolated North Atlantic island was itself a struggle. But the young officers assigned there and the civilians who worked with them made the best of it. It was a regimented yet cordial atmosphere where everyone knew and protected each other. When one young officer entered the barracks, he saw an infraction that he could not ignore. An ensign was seated by the window loading a firearm inside the barracks, an unsafe practice forbidden by regulations. The officer ordered the young man to lay down his weapon, 
but his commands were ignored. The superior was horrified to see a bullet wound on the soldier's forehead. But even more disturbing, the officer recognized the young ensign as the man he had watched die in a duel a month earlier. There was a time when gentlemen settled their differences with pistols and swords. Though never officially sanctioned, dueling was an accepted practice among military officers of the 19th century. The last duel fought in St. John's, Newfoundland has earned its place in history and in folklore. Newfoundlanders have a long-standing tradition of storytelling, passing tales down from generation to generation. The last duel is one of St. John's most enduring legends but it began innocently enough over a simple game of cards. A captain was gambling with a young, inexperienced ensign who had been consistently losing with no sign of his luck changing. The captain had already stripped him of over a month's wages and the ensign was down to his last few shillings. Not wanting to seem cowardly, he chose to place a bet. But still, Lady Luck was not on his side. Enraged by the loss and the captain's arrogance, the ensign made a huge mistake. He grabbed the captain and accused him of cheating. Grossly offended, the captain challenged him to a duel as a matter of honor. The young ensign realized he had made a terrible and possibly fatal mistake. The captain was a seasoned officer with several duels to his credit, all of them victorious. At the tender age of 17, the ensign was merely a boy playing a man's game. Although he was considered a soldier by the military, he was still in training to become an officer and had virtually no experience with weapons. The morning of the duel arrived. The ensign's only hope of survival lay in the unwritten code among duelists. It was considered unnecessary to kill your opponent. Merely wounding him was sufficient to claim victory and restore one's honor. The ensign's second was shocked. The captain had made no attempts to simply wound his opponent. The shot was intended to be fatal. The 17-year-old ensign lay dead, and the victorious captain had reclaimed his honor. He decided to celebrate with a few drinks and, ironically, a friendly game of cards.
His fellow officer was shocked by the captain's unusual behavior. Little did anyone know that this was only the beginning. Guilt is a powerful emotion, and it quickly began eating away at the captain's conscience. His behavior became more and more erratic. knows what actually became of him. He simply faded from the history books. Dueling was abolished by the British military in 1823, mere months after the young ensign's death and the captain's subsequent disappearance. Their tragic encounter marked the last fatality of this brutal ritual, earning the tale a footnote in history. The pistols have been silenced for over 175 years, but the victim of the last duel does not seem to be resting as quietly. A resident of modern St. John's was making his way home through a local park when he encountered a strange figure. It was a young man with a horrible wound on his forehead. When he turned around, the young man found himself unharmed and alone. The fort where the ensign served is long gone, but the very stones used in its construction have now been reused to build the walls that dot the modern landscape. Perhaps this has somehow anchored the young soldier's ghost to the area, or maybe his long forgotten grave rests nearby. One young couple had pulled off the road, looking for a quiet spot where they could be alone. As they got more comfortable, the woman thought she saw a shadow pass across the front of the car. Frightened, she insisted they check it out, thinking that someone might be in the woods watching them. The young man saw the ghostly figure moving through the trees. When the couple looked back, the car was empty and there was no sign of their mysterious visitor. For over a century, this young ensign has wandered through the night. Is he searching for the unfeeling captain who took his life or another dueling opponent? Whatever his motives, this ghost remains condemned to relive Newfoundland's last duel for the rest of time. Today, the Mathers House in Burnaby, British Columbia is home to the local Potter's Guild. But in a time long past, the building was the center of many horrific scandals. Some believe that it's this sordid history that may account for the spirits who have returned to haunt the site of their worst nightmares. One evening, as a ceramic artist was tidying her workroom, a toy animal crossed the table in front of her. As she looked up, she noticed the figure of a little boy playing with some other children's toys. 
the woman stood staring at him in disbelief until the young spirit began tossing his toys at her. Frightened, the artist fled, leaving behind the young ghost and his playthings. The Mathers House in Burnaby, British Columbia is now the site for the Burnaby Potters Guild. This historic house was once home to a religious group. The Canadian Temple of the More Abundant Life used this facility as a place of worship and as a school for their children. However, the leader of this group, Archbishop John I, left behind more than just an unusual bit of history. The Mathers House behind me uh, has an interesting history. It was built in 1912 for the family of William and Mary Hart. In 1935, uh, William Hart died and within four years, this house was sold to the Canadian Temple of the Universal Foundation of More Abundant Life. They set up residences for their students at the elementary and the high school levels. The temple was here for almost a decade, and it was at the end of that decade that they were found to be a cult, and they were run out of town by the province, the police, the municipality. The leader of the cult called himself Archbishop John I, although his real name was Tom Wosley, the very same Tom Wosley who was wanted in the United States on charges of bigamy and spousal abuse. Even more disturbing were the allegations of child abuse. Who left these toys in the grass? John I was no saint and had a terrible temper, often venting his rage on his students. It was not uncommon for the archbishop to chastise his kids regularly. Though the specific punishments varied, they were always harsh and cruel. I'm sick and tired of having to remind you where the toys should be, and not in the ground. At times, he would lock children in closets for hours, and there was also speculation of physical abuse. Now you sit down too. Often, he would single one child out. Then, he would yell and scream insults at the top of his lungs in order to humiliate each child in front of their peers. Are you whispering behind the dark? How many more times do I have to tell you we don't do things like that? Other than leaving a very dark mark on this house and the people who lived here under his severe discipline, Tom Wosley has disappeared from history after having been run out of town. However, children who had become victim to his humiliating acts still seem unable to sever their terrifying bonds with this place. We're not going to have any more of this, are we? Are we? There were many allegations of Archbishop John I manifesting his temper against the children who were the residences in, residents in these houses, um, where for my, even minor, misdemeanors, the children were locked up in closets for many hours at a time without any contact. Um, this may explain some of the phenomenon here. On one occasion, a maintenance man came to work. Upon entering the building, he found a misplaced toy. As he continued down the hallway, he found another. Finding these items strewn about seemed peculiar to him. Since there were no children around, inside another room, the maintenance man heard a rustling sound coming from the closet. Suddenly, the toy he was holding was snatched out of one hand, and then the other. The man stood there dumbfounded when he heard the rustling again. The noise grew louder. The man slowly and carefully walked towards the closet and peeked inside. He saw the figure of a young boy. The young spirit was obviously disturbed by the maintenance man's presence and made it abundantly clear he did not want him there. On an overnight project, an artist stayed late to finish a few pieces. As she glazed her pot, she heard thumping coming from behind the door.
but when she stopped to listen, she couldn't hear it anymore. The thumping started again. This time, she slowly walked over to the door to listen more closely. But the noise stopped a second time. She was startled when one of the ceramic pieces crashed down to the floor. And then another. The woman saw the young, ghostly figure destroying her work. She turned and struggled with the door. Someone or something was preventing her from escaping that room. Finally, the door came loose and she ran from the room. This was by far the most terrifying experience of her life. The Mathers House seems to be home to many tormented children, perhaps those who had been abused and victimized in the Archbishop's so-called religious cult have returned to relive their childhoods without persecution, but this time exercising their vengeance on anyone who enters the building. The fog-shrouded coast of St. John's, Newfoundland has a mystical quality, but when darkness falls, that beauty can instantly transform into a landscape of nightmares. In 1860, Samuel Pettyham was making his way home. He had become lost and was following lights to a nearby house when he made a horrifying discovery. He heard footsteps approaching, so he called out for help to whoever was coming. At that moment, his evening went from eerie to terrifying. Samuel Pettyham had become one of the first people to witness Newfoundland's legendary headless captain of Queen's Road. St. John's, Newfoundland is a beautiful city, rich in folklore and legend brought by the original settlers from Ireland and England. One of this magnificent island's most enduring tales is that of the headless captain of Queen's Road, a tale of betrayal, murder, and poetic justice. The legend of Newfoundland's headless captain has been passed down from parent to child for over two centuries and still endures to this day. It grew out of a story of love and betrayal that took place in a house just off Queen's Road in St. John's. In 1745, a merchant captain lived here with his young wife. Their marriage, however, was not a happy one. The passion had died a long time ago. the captain spent many months at sea, leaving his young wife alone to entertain herself. And she did with a local merchant, a jealous man who wanted the young woman for himself. Sadly, the captain's first love had always been the sea, and his ship seemed much more important to him than his young wife. Once again, he set off on another six-month voyage. In his absence, the unfaithful young woman convinced her jealous suitor that her husband was the only thing standing in the way of their love. And one evening, a plan was formed to get rid of him for good. Upon his return from the sea, the unsuspecting captain was led into the devious and deadly trap.
the captain's body was disposed of in the waters off St. John's. There were accusations made, but without evidence, the wife and her lover were never tried for the murder. Months later, the two were married and settled into the captain's house. This marriage, too, was an unhappy one. The man's business suffered, as few people wished to do business with a suspected murderer. And the wife, finding herself to be a social pariah for the same reason, became a virtual prisoner in her own home. Estranged from the community and reaching the one-year anniversary of the captain's murder, tensions began to flare. They had escaped the justice of the courts, but had no idea that a form of justice far more severe was coming for them from beyond the grave. The wife was alone in the house when she heard footsteps. She grabbed a lantern and went downstairs to investigate. When her husband returned that evening, he found her. She was physically unharmed, but terrified and ranting incoherently. When she was a bit calmer, she explained to her husband that the captain had come back. He assured her that he would stand guard. Convinced that she was hysterical, but not wanting to take any chances, he armed himself. And began what he thought would be an uneventful vigil. For a moment, he was frightened, but then realized his wife's fears were beginning to take root in his own mind. Upstairs, she sat, still trembling, when she heard a noise coming from inside the captain's old sea chest. Her husband raced upstairs. Cautiously, he approached the chest, but found nothing unusual inside. His wife had become irrational, and he tried to calm her. He swore he would make sure no one entered the house and left her one of the pistols for her own security. He returned to the downstairs parlor, now more concerned with his wife's sanity than any intruders. The hours of the night wore on. Sleep eventually overtook him she restlessly played cards to occupy her mind.
he was awakened by the sound of footsteps echoing throughout the house. As the sound drew closer and closer, fear began to cloud her mind. She was terrified of what might be lurking behind the door. Seeing what she had done, she knew there was no escaping justice a second time. Resigned to her fate, she went to the sea chest and pulled a hidden bundle out from the bottom. She unwrapped the very sword they had used to kill the captain and brought it to her own throat. That night, the headless captain of Queen's Road may have found the justice he sought, but he is still seen in St. John's, roaming the streets where his home once stood. Perhaps he is searching for something more than the revenge he found. Or maybe the legend inspired the overactive imaginations of those who still claim to glimpse him. Skeptics insist it is merely a story, but for the many who have witnessed this dark, headless figure, there is little doubt that this folktale has a terrifying life of its own. The Assiniboia Club in Regina, Saskatchewan is one of the most exclusive private clubs in Canada. For over a century, it has represented success and prosperity. But one tragic incident may have left a permanent mark on this illustrious society. While distinguished men and women celebrate their achievements, another forgotten soul may be trapped in her eternal world of anguish and despair. A lifelong member was settling down for a glass of brandy and a quiet game of billiards. The pool balls had broken with such force that one had flown off the table and rolled into the hallway. Ascending the stairs was a beautiful woman. More than just striking, there was something ethereal about her. She smiled at him seductively, and then she vanished. Returning to the billiard room, he was shocked to find the balls had been re-racked perfectly, with the exception of the one ball in his hand. Good night. Regina Saskatchewan's Assiniboia Club has a long and distinguished history. Its membership being a virtual who's who of Regina's wealthiest and most influential citizens. There is another longtime resident of the club, and though her origins are less than prestigious, she has still earned her place on the club's roster. Cineboya Club was established in 1882 and operated as a gentleman's club well into the 80s. It is to this day the oldest private club in Canada still in existence. 
There are many ghostly occurrences that have happened over the years. Women in the club who have had experiences with our ghost uh, never seem to have a negative experience. It's always the men that seem to leave here a little bit, a little bit creepy, a little bit creeped out. Some theorize that the ghost of the Assiniboia Club may be that of an abused woman who reaches out to other women, hoping that they could offer her understanding and perhaps empathize with her for the emotional pain she had suffered. On one occasion, Jennifer, a longtime waitress at the club, got the distinct impression that the spirit was trying to communicate with her. Walking past one of the meeting rooms, she saw a strange pulsing light coming from inside. There stood the beautiful woman, bathed in a brilliant aura. Then suddenly, Jennifer experienced images flashing through her mind, horrifying glimpses of violence and murder. She was convinced that something terrible had happened to this woman in this very room and that now her spirit was seeking the compassion only another female could offer. This would not be the two women's last encounter. The spirit of the Assiniboia Club becomes attracted to certain males, flirting with them and sometimes becoming fixated. Given the circumstances of her life, it would not be surprising if she were still searching for a man's love and attention, even after her death. A playful, romantic ghost would not be such an unsettling experience were it not for another of her female characteristics, jealousy. Jennifer was having an innocent conversation with a male staff member who had also recently encountered the club's resident ghost. Little did either of them know he was the new object of the spirit's affection, and seeing Jennifer and him together obviously upset her. In a moment of anger, the spirit actually pushed Jennifer onto a nearby couch. Though Jennifer was startled, she later realized the spirit meant no real harm. She was merely expressing herself in the only way she could, and the message was loud and clear stay away from my man. The legend tells of an era back before the 1920s, back in the days when of course it was still operating as a, a gentleman's club. In those days a business deal was often sealed with a handshake and the promise of a lady companion for the evening. In the 19th century these ladies of the evening would bring members upstairs to what are now meeting rooms. One young woman was entertaining a client in an upper chamber. It is thought she may have grown too attached to this man and presumed him for a more exclusive relationship. No one knows exactly what was said that night, whether she asked for money or simply love. Either way, he felt threatened and an argument broke out. He stormed off, leaving her alone and angry. But he soon returned, this time carrying an axe. The two struggled. And the results were tragic. There was never any thought given to reporting the murder. The crime committed was quickly and quietly covered up and the body disposed of. Although many long to join, membership in the Assiniboia Club is incredibly exclusive and reserved for only a select group of Regina's elite. But to this beautiful woman, it has become her prison. Perhaps she has remained here bound to the scene of her death, eternally searching
for the same things all of us seek in life, love and compassion. Although this park in Hamilton, Ontario is primarily known for its wonderful landscape, it also has the reputation of being a supernatural hotspot. A local woman, familiar with the rumors of hauntings, came to the area to take some photographs. She was hoping to capture a ghostly image on film. Though she never ended up with any photographic evidence, she did have a face-to-face -face encounter with the legendary ghost of Jane Riley. The Albion Falls are located at the southernmost tip of Kings Forest Park in Hamilton, Ontario. In the early 19th century, a young woman, heartbroken from a love affair gone wrong, stood at the top of a cliff not far from the Thundering Falls and leaped to her death 100 feet below. The steep drop has since been dubbed Lover's Leap, and numerous encounters with this forlorn young woman have been reported. The history of Lover's Leap has become popular folklore amongst many of the locals who live in the Hamilton area. My name is George Brady. I'm with HamiltonParanormal.com. The site that we were at today is called Albion Fall. What we do is uh, we go for all throughout and the Hamilton Wentworth region and beyond to get and collect information on haunted locations. In my opinion, Mount Albion Falls does have spirit activity. The tragic love story from which the legend was born is filled with great promise and terrible sorrow. A young man by the name of Joseph Russo would come to Albion Falls to meet his true love, Jane Riley. Often, they would spend the day strolling the area. It was their favorite place, and it was there that Joseph proclaimed his undying love for Jane. Their hearts were filled with passion. The two were happier than they had ever been. As they gazed out at the falls, time stood still for them. However, a tragic turn of events would plague these falls with eternal sadness. Young Joseph was worried about his wedding night. Wanting it to be perfect, he requested a meeting with the madam of a local bordello, hoping she could offer him some advice. The two met at the bottom of the gorge. With plenty of experience in the ways of love, the madam assured Joseph that when the time came, his feelings for Jane would guide him. Meanwhile, Jane, who knew nothing of Joseph's concern, came to the falls looking for him. But when she peered over to the foot of the gorge, she found her beloved Joseph hugging a local prostitute. Jane misinterpreted what she saw, assuming the two were involved in an affair. She was devastated. Joseph called out to her. He wanted to explain. but she was heartbroken and ran off trying to hide her tears. For Jane, her once favorite place became a painful reminder of Joe's infidelity. Now the falls would bring her nothing but heartache. She was desperate for answers and returned to the gorge hoping to discover some clue that would explain Joseph's uncharacteristic actions. As she looked down at the steep cliff, she hoped her sorrow would subside. But it did not. 
At that moment, she decided to end her own life. Jane had snuck out of her home up to the ledge of Lover's Leap, and she had committed the act of suicide by tossing herself over into the gorge, and she plunged to her death 120 feet. Her body was found on September the 4th, 1915. And from that moment on, Jane Riley's spirit, even today, on a moonlit night, one can hear silent sobs at the bottom of the Albion Falls Gorge. It seems that now, Jane Riley is forever bound to her once beloved Albion Falls. And since her death, many witnesses have reported seeing her ghost wandering the area. A man who had spent the day hiking the trails of the park was on his way home he crossed the parking lot to his vehicle and suddenly felt as if he was not alone. Glancing over his shoulder, he saw the figure of a woman. She seemed to appear out of nowhere. As he started his car, the ghost came into view again. He was frightened and desperate to leave the park. It seemed as if the spirit was everywhere at once. Then, in an instant, she vanished. Regaining his composure, the man left as quickly as he could, leaving behind the park, the falls, and the legend of Jane Riley. While Hamilton's Albion Falls, with its cascading waterfalls, is a place filled with beauty, it also contains the great and tragic sorrow of a love gone wrong. Since Jane Riley plummeted to her death, this place has become known as Lover's Leap. Here her troubled spirit still roams the captivating landscape and her eternal quest to understand how something so beautiful could have ended with such heartbreak continues. <laughs>